can stop Maharaj from preaching to devotees. He is an authority on the, on the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam, and the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and other revered scriptures on Bhakti Yoga. He makes the ancient wisdom accessible, practical, and relatable to everybody, be they children, teenagers, householders, or seniors. He has been a teaching, he has been a teaching faculty at the Mayapur Institute for more than 10 years now. Maharaj also leads the annual Navadvip Mandala Parikram. Uh, so with no further ado, let me please, um, uh, let, let us please give a loud Hari Bol for a Maharaj. Hari Bol! Hari Bol! I thought we could sing a song, one of Bhakti Vinod Thakur's songs. I think all of you know it. Yeah. Sri Nam Kirtan. Yasomati Nandana Prajaparana Kara Gokula Ranjana Thana Yasomati Nandana Nandana Braja Barana Kara Kokula Rantana Oh, mm -hmm. 
Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Kiti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pucharine Nirvise Sasunyavani Paschatya Deshatari Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Very happy to see all of you nice devotees today. I have the good fortune to address you to try to present something on our Krishna conscious philosophy. So those of you who are reading Srila Prabhupada's books, then you will know one of the main subjects of Bhagavad Gita is surrender. And this, of course, can be, it can sound something very challenging to all of us to think, oh, surrender, oh. <laughs> I, I remember myself as a new devotee, I, when, when I first started to visit the temple, our center, I went to the center in London as a young man and they were talking to me about surrender. You know, it sounded something quite terrifying. <laughs> uh, I was, I could say I, I was quite rebellious as a, a young person. I grew up in the, in the 60s, 1960s. Of course, most of you were not born even then. So. <laughs> You were in some other body, <laughs> in some other place. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, in the 1960s, it was something of a revolutionary period in the world. People were rebelling, they wanted change. And I was certainly thinking about the importance of change. You know, I wanted to understand more about the goal of life and why I'm here, what is this life meant for? So I, had a, I always had a lot of questions and I was never able to get any real satisfactory answers until I met the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And I, I first of all met the Krishna Consciousness Movement in one of Srila Prabhupada's literatures. First, a, a Back to Godhead magazine, which in those days was uh, just simply color page on the cover and inside was all black and white. Nowadays you don't see so much Back to Godhead magazine. It's become more an in-house magazine now. Previously we, we would use it for mass distribution to introduce people to Krishna consciousness. But in recent years it's become more just a, a magazine for the congregation. Anyway, I got the Bank to Godhead and later on I got a Krishna book and then I met, I found that devotee had another book by Prabhupada. And I was very impressed that the one man who tried did so many different books. So one, the, his book was the, the topmost yoga system, and I'd taken the Krishna book. At that time, it was only volume one. The volume two hadn't even been published. But I was very attracted to the beauty of the books, and when I read the book, then it was even more awakening that it had so much information and it seemed to answer all of my questions which I had about life. I certainly wanted to understand more about the goal of life and 
why I'm here, where I'm going. And this book seemed to answer everything which I could question about. And so I was inspired to go and visit the temple and start, I started to go regularly. And I was attending every evening. We had, we had a deities, Prabhupada had somehow managed to get Radha Krishna deities, which are now worshipped today as Radha London Ishwara. Of course, Krishna is not simply London Ishwara, he's, you know, he's the controller of the whole universe, right? He's Param Ishwara. But anyway, Prabhupada gave that name to the deities. In France, of course, you have also Radha Parish, Paris Ishwara. And so, Prabhupada had some interesting names for the deities. In Delhi, for example, in Delhi, the deities are Radha Partha Sarati. It's unusual, Partha Sarati with Radha. Not, not very common, you know. Radha, of course, is in Vrindavan. Of course, she did go to Kurukshetra. She did go. Kurukshetra was the only place outside of Vrindavan where Radha and Krishna were together. But that wasn't at the time when Krishna was Partha Sarati. That was when Krishna came from Dwarka on the occasion of the solar eclipse. He'd come along with all of his wives and all of the family members and entourage. They'd come to Kurukshetra to observe the eclipse. And Krishna had arranged that the gopis would all come from Vrindavan and meet him at that time. He'd sent a letter, he had someone go there to Vrindavan and request the gopis that you should all come to, come to Kurukshetra and we will meet there. So of course Krishna had left Vrindavan, he'd gone to Mathura. When he went to Mathura at that time, the cowherd boys came with Krishna to Mathura. They came to attend the wrestling match in Mathura. You know, Kamsa had arranged for the wrestling <coughs> match to take place. And uh, Lord Krishna, at that time, he had come with the cowherd boys, the gopas. The cowherd girls were staying back. You know, ladies stay back, take care of the cows and the children and so on. And the cowherd men, Nanda Maharaj, and Coward boys, Subal and all that, they all came. So that was in Mathura. And so Lord Krishna, of course, he'd gone to Dwarka and he'd married all of his wives. And then he's coming to Kurukshetra to observe the eclipse. And they came with all the great sages of Vyasa and everyone. So Lord Krishna wants to meet the gopis and they came. So Radha also. She was there also with them. So Kurukshetra has that significance that it's the only place outside of Vrindavan where Radha and Krishna were together. So I mean, I don't know if, why Prabhupada called that name Radha Partha Sarati. It's like, certainly it's an unusual name for the Radha and Krishna. But anyway, the deities are there. You can see in East of Kailash temple there, beautiful temple, and beautiful deity worship also, very nicely worshipped. Initially, we were worshipping, I'd I gone to India 1975, and at that time, we had simply a small rented house in the Bengali market. <laughs> You know Bengali market? <laughs> People from Delhi may know Bengali market. Big same sweet shop. <laughs> Have you ever tasted? Oh. <laughs> that, yeah, Bengali sweets. Big same sweet shop. And so we were there in, in the rented house and I got it. 1975, our music, our movement was very small, just a few devotees. And there was one householder couple from the USA were looking after the temple. They just 
Tejas Prabhu, very wonderful Prabhupada disciple. So he was running the Delhi temple. And of course, Delhi 1975, nobody spoke English, you know, everyone. Is, and it's a Ram town. It's Ram, Ram. People are more Ram conscious than Krishna conscious, you know. And so it was quite difficult, but somehow Prabhupada uh, got us to keep a temple there. And then later on, Gopal Krishna Maharaj came there. And Gopal Krishna Maharaj had the determination, being a, for some, a native Indian and food, could speak Hindi and everything nicely, so he could develop the temple. And now there's so many centers there in Delhi and so many devotees, wonderful, con huge congregation. But initially it was very small, six, there were like six people staying there in Total Mao Lane, Bengali market. <laughs> now they have huge temples. They just opened a big temple in uh, Rohini. In Rohini, yeah. Rohini is probably the biggest, I, I'm told it's the biggest housing subdivision in Asia. Yeah. The most number of people. Huge. Huge area. And they opened a very nice temple, very opulent temple. <laughs> Gopal Krishna Maharaj opened just before he left the world. And another one is coming up in Dwarka. Big temple is coming up there. And so there's like about 14 temples now in Delhi. Prabhupada had said there should be a temple in every marketplace. <laughs> there in Delhi. So it, it, it takes time to establish our Krishna consciousness movement. It takes surrender. Just like staying in Delhi, it, it's not very easy. In the summer, very hot, right? What's the temperature there now? Maybe 50 or so. Yes. Yeah, like that. And in the winter, very cold. <laughs> very cold. It can go almost zero. So it takes surrender to be there in that, those conditions. And Srila Prabhupada was traveling regularly between Vrindavan and Delhi. He would print his books in Delhi, print, printing first of all a newspaper and then printing books. And that's where he was beginning. He was preparing himself for the worldwide mission of spreading Krishna consciousness. So it took, it took surrender. We all have to surrender. Just like a mother. If you know those of you who are a mother, you have to surrender a lot, isn't it? Just to be a mother, to take care of a family, to take it, look after children. It takes it's a constant endeavor. So much service is required. You have to cook for them, you have to nurse them, you have to counsel them, you have to be a guide, you have to be their mentor, you, you have to give everything. So many qualities are required. And so it, it's surrender. And, and many things we have to surrender to. You work in a job, it requires also a lot of Surrender, working for a company. You work in the corporate world. You know, if you're in the corporate world, they want you to wake up in the morning and think about your, your company, you know. <laughs> How many sales have you brought in? How are the customers? And, you know, they want you to be thinking just about the job and your, how, your results and how you're how you're performing in that service for the company. They want you to sell your soul, right? For the <laughs> so surrender, surrender is there in many different aspects of life. And Lord Krishna had spoke about surrender earlier in the fourth chapter, I think it was of the Bhagavad Gita, 
Lord Krishna said, Ye yatamam prapadyante tamstataiva vajamya. As you surrender unto me, I reward you accordingly. So that was an initial statement from Krishna about surrender. That as we surrender, in other words, Krishna reciprocates according to us, it's according to how we relate to him. It's not that Krishna is forcing us, you know, somebody comes in with a gun and says, surrender, you know. <laughs> you know, sometimes you're in these kind of terrible situations, maybe during wartime, the enemy comes, surrender, <laughs> you know, you, and so Krishna is not like that. He's not someone who is forcing all of us to surrender. But he understands our situation and he reciprocates accordingly. As we approach him, Krishna responds. He's bhakta vatsala. He reciprocates with the devotees. He's not jnana vatsala and he's not karma vatsala, but he's bhakta vatsala. He wants that devotion. He wants us to have that, to approach him with that loving mood. That is a real thing which Krishna wants, right? He's not anxious for our patram, pushpam, palam, toyam the leaf, the flower, the fruit and water, they're not very important to Lord Krishna. He has many goddesses of fortune all serving him. And so our little fruit and flowers are not so meaningful, but what he really wants is that love, that devotion, that bhakti. And to give that love, of course, we, we have to surrender, we have to we have to submit ourselves in a manner which is done without any feeling of getting something back. That is the true meaning of devotion, that it's selfless service. So again, that's another frightening thing that, oh, selfless service. <laughs> We know about selfish, <laughs> but to be selfless, that's quite difficult for us. We have to gradually come to that mood of selflessness. And the more we become in knowledge of the teachings of Lord Krishna, then the more we can understand about our real self. That is really the first thing which we have to do. We have to understand and, and fully embrace the principle that I'm not the body, that I am a soul living in the body. So this is, the, of course, this is the initial teaching in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna is speaking the difference between the body and the soul. Lord Krishna is explaining that the body is just like the dress. And just as we change the dress, we change also the body. It's a vehicle. We see here in Holland so many vehicles, right? A lot of German vehicles, of course, and then a few others also. So people change the vehicles. Our bodies also change. Dehinosmin yata dehe komaram yovanam jara. Komar, the young boy. Yovanam, youth, and jara, old age. We change the bodies. Lord Krishna says also, Vashamsi Kirnani Yata Vihaya Navani Krinati Naroparani Tata Sharirani Chihaya Jarnani Anyani Samyati Navani Dehi 
Just as we change the dress, we change the body. We have to embrace this philosophy that I am a soul. Srila Prabhupada used to force us to come to the spiritual platform. And even with reporters, when they would come and question him, he would like to bring them to a higher consciousness. He would not just simply mechanically answer their questions and give them information, but he would use everything as an opportunity to present the Krishna conscious philosophy. Sometimes the reporters would say, how old are you Swamiji? And he would say, I am the same age as you. <laughs> he would, and then they would, they would be shocked. And then Prabhupada would go on to explain that we are all souls living in the body. Our souls are eternal. Now my body may be so much elder than older than yours, but 50 years ago I was in a young body and you were in the old body. <laughs> right? We were in some other body. So the situation changes, but we don't identify with the body. That makes surrender easier, the more we're detached from the body. We want to give up that identification with the body. We want to understand ourselves in a spiritual sense. And that brings about peace and harmony in the world. People will be happy and sad. Oh, it's such a relief to know I'm not the body. It's so terrible. The body, this body is just meant to give us pain and trouble. You know, if you get, you get a thorn in your foot, it's terrible. Or if somebody, someone sticks you in the, pulls your hair, you feel the pain. Someone bends your finger, it's very painful. A tooth can give you so much agony. So many parts of the body, they're just made to give you pain and trouble. Where to get the pleasure? We want happiness. We want pleasure. Where do we find the pleasure? You don't get pleasure simply from the body. We have to go deeper. We have to understand ourselves as a soul, as a spiritual being. So this is the idea of surrender, to understand, first of all, ourselves as a spiritual being, and then understand that we have also a relationship with the Supreme. And that's why He is coming in the form of, is coming to Lord Krishna on the battlefield, and He's telling Arjuna, surrender. Give up all of your religion. Sarva Dharma Parigyachna. Now, it's confusing for people sometimes because they think Lord Krishna came to establish Dharma. But now, in the 18th chapter, 66, almost at the end of Lord Krishna's teaching, he's saying, surrender. Give up all your dharma. What is, what is the meaning? He came to establish dharma. Yada hmm. yadahi dharmasya glanir bhavati He He's come to establish dharma. And now he's saying give up dharma. We have to understand what does Lord Krishna mean. That he wants us to give up all of our pre pretentious religion. Religions where we are not actually genuine in approaching him. But we have some ulterior motive. 
We want to get something from him. This is material, that is called in Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Vyasadeva describes it as Kaitava Dharma, meaning cheating religion, not actually genuine religion, but pretentious religion. Some motive is there that we're going to God, we're praying to God, but we want to get something from Him. We're not coming to give. Srila Prabhupada went to America in 1960s and people thought he was coming to beg. Prabhupada said, I'm not coming to beg from you. I'm coming to give you what you have forgotten. So this was Srila Prabhupada's message, that he wanted to give people that consciousness of God and their eternal relationship with God. So Srila Prabhupada taught what is real, genuine devotion, bhakti. The devotion must be unmotivated. It sh we should not have any r desire to get something from Krishna. But we should think, Krishna has given me so much. Sometimes we don't appreciate what Krishna has given us. That he has given us everything. He has given us food, water, air, He's given us life, He's given us energy, He's given us intelligence, He's given us everything. This body is, is a gift from Krishna and He's given us this world also. We have to use it properly for the service of God. So that should be understood that he is the master and we are the servants. We want to serve. The, the service industry is common in the world today, right? Yes. Service industry. There's not so much manufacturing going on. It's all service. So Krishna consciousness is the original service industry. Our business is to do service for mankind, not only mankind, for all living entities. We want to serve all living entities because they are all, we are all parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. Krishna consciousness is the highest welfare activity because it's beneficial to all living entities. People generally they're concerned about mankind, feed the hungry people, help the homeless, help the people if there's some uh, war or something then refugees will be there. We want to help them and give shelter. But what about the other living entities? The animals, there are animal welfare group. Uh, Nitai Ati Priya was telling me about how there's a group in Holland taking care of different animals in unfortunate situations, trying to help them. But not only the animals, we're concerned also for the, the trees, the plants, all forms of life. We want to help all living entities to come to their original consciousness of God. So that it's an, an awakening process. It is part of the surrender process coming to understand our spiritual identity. It's an awakening. We start to see the truth. We were born 
in ignorance. We often recite a prayer, Om Agyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya, that I was born in the darkest ignorance, but my spiritual master opened my eyes with the light of knowledge. I offer my obeisances unto him. So this surrendering process is something which we are all taking part in. Just like you surrender your Sunday afternoon or today Saturday, your Saturday afternoon, we're having a program here on Saturdays, you're surrendering your time to come here, take part in this program. It's surrender. We surrender waking up every morning, <laughs> right? We, sometimes it's difficult to surrender, to wake up, to get up, but, but we have to do it. We have to surrender. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, surrender, give up all forms of religion. Give up all religion which is materially motivated. We're going to God and we're simply wanting to, to get something from Him. So we want to appreciate what has been given to us by God. Then real devotion can come about. Just like if you have a child and your child comes to you and asks you, Mother, Mother, you're such a nice mother. I love you so much. You're so kind to me. I mean, please, can you get me a new mobile phone? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, uh, and sometimes our approach to God is a little bit like that, you know, that we're praying to God, but we want to get something from Him. So God hears the prayers, He hears these prayers, but, you know, some prayers are more pleasing to Him than others. If our prayer is always to ask him for something, then he thinks, oh, oh, another something else on the list, you know. <laughs> but if we simply glorify the Lord, that is more pleasing to him. And you can see beautiful prayers, just like we sing in our temples every morning, we sing the Govinda prayers. And if you've attended the darshan, of the deities in the morning, you can hear the Govinda prayer sung by the devotees. Uh, Govinda Madhipursham Tamaham Bhajami. So Lord Brahma composed these beautiful prayers and he's simply describing the beauty of Lord Krishna. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is adapted playing on the flute with blooming eyes like lotus petals, whose head is bedecked with a peacock feather, whose figure of beauty is tinged with the hue of blue clouds, and whose unique loveliness is charming millions of cupids. This is Lord Brahma's, one of his prayers. He's, he's just appreciating the beauty of Krishna. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who's in engaged in tending the cows, fulfilling all desires, in abodes built with spiritual gems, sound, surrounded by wish-fulfilling trees, always served by great reverence and affection by hundreds of thousands of Lakshmis or gopis. So these prayers are very sweet. And you can hear also Queen Kunti also pray to Krishna. Her prayers are very interesting. She's saying to Krishna, let all these calamities happen again and again. Usually we pray to God, oh Krishna, help me, you know, but we have some terrible calamity and we pray to God, oh, please take care of this problem for me. But Queen Kunti says, let all the calamities happen again and again because I will see you again and again. And by seeing you, 
means I will no more see birth and death. So this is Queen Kunti's way of seeing problems, that she sees them as an opportunity to come closer to Krishna. And she also glorifies Krishna very nicely. She, Krishnaya Vasudevaya Devaki Nandanaya Cha Nanda Gopal Komaraya Govindaya Namo Namaha Namo Pat Namo Pat Pat no, namo Pankajam Natraya Namo Pankajam Malane Namo Pankajam Netraya Samaste Pankajam Garaye Queen Kunti is appreciating the beauty of Krishna, that he is the son of Nanda Maharaj and he is living in Vrindavan and he's the darling of all people of Vrindavan and every day he's with the cows and he's always dressed with a, lot a garland of lotus flowers and he has eyes like the lotus flower and his belly, his navel was marked like the depression of a lotus flower and he has lotus feet also. His feet are engraved with lotus flowers. This is how to remember Krishna. Not that we just think of Krishna as our order supplier. You know, you go to, you go to give me this, give me that. <laughs> give me a wife, give me a house, give me a home by the sea. Om Jai Jagadisha. <laughs> We want to understand what Krishna is saying. So give me pure love and devotion, right? Not love which is motivated. That is the idea of surrender. So how to do that? You know, in, in second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, we're told that even you have all material desires, still you can worship Krishna. Akama sarva kama va moksha kama udharati tevrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. Even you have all material desires or no material desires or you desire liberation, whatever you desire, still you should worship Lord Krishna, the Supreme Lord. This is Lord Krishna. He's very open to everyone. Whatever your mood is, you want to request something from him, no problem, Krishna will hear you. But he's more pleased when there's pure love, naturally. It's more pleasing to him. So Lord Krishna instructs Arjuna, and instructing not only Arjuna, but all of us, that taking shelter of Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna will free us from all dangers. Do not fear. Material world, we are all fearful. We live in fear. Right? We have fear. Fear of the economy crumbling. Fear of the price of petrol increasing. <laughs> fear of COVID. Fear of this and that, everything, so many problems, the things to be fearful of. But Lord Krishna said, if we surrender to him, then we have nothing to fear. Because Lord Krishna promises he will protect us. But we have to remember our identity. Who are we? We are all souls, spiritual beings. We are not this body. And we can understand this the more we chant Hare Krishna mantra. The more you're engaged in chanting Hare Krishna mantra and worshipping Krishna and reading the books about Krishna, then the, the less you will fear the material world. Because you will be situated in pure consciousness. We, we just want to take care of our consciousness, be conscious of Krishna. And how to do it is made very easy for us by 
chanting his holy name. That is Lord Chaitanya's gift to the world, that everyone can chant the Maha Mantra. The young children also can chant every day. You should chant, you should have kirtan in your home. Just last night we were in Rotterdam temple and we had kirtan and the devotees there did such wonderful kirtan. And I was surprised that they were so expert. And the one man told me, he said, yeah, these are my sons. And told me that my sons, I said, oh, they're so good in kirtan. He said, oh, yes, we do kirtan every day at home. So in his home, he's doing kirtan every day. He said, when we do RT, we do kirtan. And the children were so expert, Madanga and Kartals, and oh, wonderful, very good. So I see here also the Prabhu's two sons, they're also doing very nice kirtan. We encourage all of you, chant in your, chant in your homes regularly. Make it a regular program to chant with the family. Bring the family together and do kirtan and chant the holy name. The family which chants together will stay together. <laughs> So you want to encourage them in this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. They're so fortunate at an early age to come to Krishna consciousness. We're told in Srimad Bhagavatam, Prahlad Maharaj says, Komar Acharit Pragna Dharmam Bhagavatam From the beginning of life, Komar. Right? Lord Krishna's childhood, there's Kumar, Poganda, and Kishore, three stages. So, first five years of life, Kumar, from the beginning of life, Kumar Acharat Pragno Dharmam Bhagavatam Miha. They should learn this Bhagavat Dharma. They should learn about chanting the holy name and hearing about Lord Krishna. So today is actually the disappearance day of a very important personality. We just wanted to speak a few minutes about Shamananda Pandit. Shamananda Pandit was one of the saints who uh, brought Krishna consciousness to Orissa. He was based more in Orissa. Today we have a lot of Nice devotees coming from Orissa. Gorgovinda Maharaj, of course, he's disappeared. He was originally from Orissa. And there are many other Prabodhananda Maharaj, uh, uh, Vaishnava Maharaj, different sannyasis and Iskon. Many are from Orissa. So Orissa was the place where Shamananda Pandit was preaching. But initially, his family were from Beng they were Bengali and they lived in Midnapur, and, which was a part of Orissa. And for, as a young child, he was very attracted to the, the deity and to, to, to chanting mantras and to being with devotees. And the family saw his interest in devotional activities. And they told him, you should get a guru, you should take a guru. He said, I know who my guru is. And they were surprised. And he told them, he said, my guru is Red Eye Chaitanya. And somehow, he had already decided who his spiritual master was going to be. It's important. Everybody should have a guru. Hmm. We said, Janame Janabe Sabi Pita Matapai. Krishna Guru Nahimili Bajahariyai. Everyone has got a mother and father. The, the, have a mother and father. Oh, everyone's got that. The birds, the insects, the bees, they all have their mother and father. Only the fortunate person has got Guru. And by the grace of Guru, you'll get Krishna. Krishna Guru Nahimili Bajahariyai. So very important, everyone should have a spiritual teacher. 
And Guru is representative of Krishna, connects us to Krishna. So Shamananda Pandit was a young boy, actually his name was Duki as a young boy. Duki. The mother had had a miscarriage many times. She'd given birth different times and somehow she wasn't able, children didn't grow or they, they died very early. So when this boy came, they thought, we'll give him the name Duki, then maybe Yamaraj will not trouble us. <laughs> it won't take him away. So he was called Duki, and Duki of course meaning sad, right? <laughs> so anyway, he, they saw he was very devotional. And so they told him, you get a guru. So he became the guru of this Rudoy Chaitanya. Rudoy Chaitanya was a disciple of Goridas Pandit. There were two brothers. There was Surya Das Pandit and Goridas Pandit. Surya Das Pandit, you know, he's a the father-in-law of Lord Nityananda. Lord Nityananda accepted the two daughters of Surya Das Pandit as his wife, Janava and uh, and what other Janava and her sister anyway. <laughs> so two, the two girls both married to Lord Nityananda, and uh, Surya Das Pandit was the father of the two girls. And he had a younger brother named Goridas Pandit. And both these two brothers, they were great devotees of Lord Chaitanya. And they had Gornitai deities. You can go there today, you can see these deities. They're very beautiful, very special. They're from Nimwood, carved out of Nimwood. And they're worshipped there in a place called Ambika Kauna. Ambika Kauna. It's in Bengal. It's not far away from Mayapur. If you go to Mayapur, you can take a car for an hour or so and you get there. Or you can go by train. And it's a nice place to see. So, Gori Das Pandits, he had a temple there where he worshipped these deities of Chaitanya. And these deities were almost exactly like Gornitai. They said Gornita, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda had come there and they carved this, the deities from the exact from the likeness of Chaitanya and Nityananda. So what happened was Goridas Pandit, he his disciple was Ridoy Chaitanya. Now Ridoy Chaitanya, his name was initially Ridoyananda. But what happened was one day they were having kirtan, and the kirtan was so intense that the two deities came off the altar and began to dance in the kirtan. The two deities, there were two sets of Gornitai, you know, the Chaitanya was here, and they didn't know which one was the deity and which one was the, the Chaitanya Nichananda. And so, Goridas Pandit was so upset that the deities came off the altar, he chased them with a stick. <laughs> and then Gornitai, they hid themselves in his heart. So he got the name Ridoy Chaitanya. One who Chaitanya is in his heart. So Shamananda, this boy Duki, Duki, he came to Ridoy Chaitanya, and he was with him, serving him in the temple. And Ridoy Chaitanya saw this boy, he's very nice, he's very good, he's very obedient, he's very intelligent, he wants, he wants to learn. So he thought, I will send him to Guru Kula. I will send him to Jiva Goswami, because Jiva Goswami was living in Vrindavan, and he had opened a school there to teach the young boys. So he sent this boy Duki to go there to learn from Jiva Goswami. So there in the Gurukula of Jiva Goswami, he got the association of Naratam Das Thakur and Srinivas Acharya. They were intimate friends. They were the three most advanced students in the school. 
they were and they were they were learning not sadhana bhakti but uh, they were rather dragonoka bhakti they were they were advanced devotees so shaman aduki was there and he was he was given a service while he was there the gurukula his service was to sweep the area where Radha and Krishna dance Rasa Leela. There's a kunja there, which is a very sacred spot where Radha and Krishna eternally perform Rasa Leela. So every day Shamanan uh, Duki would go there and sweep. And one day it happened, he found some ankle bell there. And he saw this ankle bell was very special. It was very fulgent. And when he touched it, just by the touch of the ankle bell, he could feel transformation of spiritual energy coming in his body. And he was amazed. It was so powerful. He understood this must belong to some divine being. So he took the ankle bell. For some time he wore it around his neck. Then he thought, I better keep it safe. And he buried it somewhere in the ground, where later he thought, I can always get it, I'll find it. So, what had happened, Radharani had been there, and the Krishna had been there, and all the gopis, and they were dancing Rasa Leela. And they had become so ecstatic, that at one point, Radharani lost her ankle bell. And she, it was, Later, that she remembered that, oh, my ankle bell. And she asked one of the gopis, she asked uh, Vi uh, Vishaka, her intimate friend, can you go and get back, get back my ankle bell? I left, I've lost it in the kunj there where we were dancing. So she, Vishaka went there and she found this boy, Dukkha, sweeping there. And she asked him, did you find any ankle bell there? So he could understand that, who is this lady, you know, who is she, yeah, where are you from, what's your name, who are you, and, and she told him, she tried to tell him something. He said, okay, I'll go there, let me go there and see if you're really, you know, I want to check with your family. You say it was your sister who lost her ankle bells, I want to see her, you know, take me there. And so, you know, she, she was defeated, so she had to reveal her real identity that she was actually a gopi and the ankle bell belonged to Srimati Radharani. So he gave her back the ankle bell and when he gave it to her, then she touched him on the forehead with the ankle bell and she put a mark on his forehead and at the same time his tea light became two lines and in the middle there was this mark and she said, I'm giving you the lotus feet of Radharani is marking on your tea lank as your forehead. So in this way Shamananda received the special tea lank. And she said, I'm also changing your name. Your name will no longer be Duki, it will be Shamananda. And so she gave him this name and so Shamananda went back and he told Jiva Goswami what had happened. And Jiva Goswami said, this is secret, don't tell anybody. But everybody found out that he's got a new name and the word came to his guru and the guru was very upset. Look, I gave him the name uh, Duki Krishna. I initiated him as Duki Krishna. How can you change the name to Shamananda? And guru was upset. He was my disciple. Who are you to change his name? Who changed his name? And the guru came there, and there's a big argument. And, and Shamananda is saying, only by your mercy, Guru Dev, I've got this name. It's only by your mercy. And Guru said, I never give you any mercy. You change your name. <laughs> so then he said, if, if Radharani really gave you that name, then this marking will not rub off. And so when they tried to rub the marking off, they couldn't rub it off. So he, the Guru then understood that this, this name and this tea like had all been given by Radharani. So today is the day in which Shamananda disappeared from this world. Later on, Shamananda had gone 
He'd been sent by Jiva Goswami, the three of them, Naratam Das, Thakur, and Srinivas Acharya, and Shamananda Pandit, the three, had been given all the books of the Goswamis to bring back to Bengal because Lord Chaitanya had disappeared from the world and all the devotees were feeling the separation and they needed to take shelter of the teachings of the Goswamis. So they had all the books, they brought all, you know, there was no Zoom. There was no, there was no Zoom, there was no mobile phone, there was no astral TV or anything, you know. And so they had the books all written on palm leaves and they had a big cup and they brought all the books, they were bringing them back. And the three devotees, Srinivas, Shamananda and Naratam, they brought the books back. Of course, on the way, the books all got stolen. <laughs> but anyway, they got them back after some time. And Shamananda went to Arissa and he preached there all over Arissa. And he made many wonderful devotees. Most principal, his first disciple was Rasikananda. You can read about Rasikananda. And there's a nice book about him, about his pastimes. So Shamananda was a spiritual master. And he was a very, very great personality. He disappeared from this world today. Now we're remembering him. Okay, so are there any questions? Uh, yes? Shamananda Swami also received a uh, deity of Krishna, which is it? Uh, Radha Shama Sundar. Yes, Radha Shama Sundar is the deity of... Yes, That's right. a beautiful temple. Yes, right. They have a temple in Vrindavan. If you go to Vrindavan, they have... Today, of course, will be a festival there, that temple. And Shama, Radha Shama Sundar, where his personal deities. <laughs> Anyone else had any Could yeah. you share some uh, memories with Srila Prabhupada? Oh, memories with Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> well, well I, I remember when I was initiated, uh, I, uh, we, we were in the temple in Bari Place. It was Srila Prabhupada came and he said, okay, how many people we should initiate? And they brought the list of different devotees for initiation. And so Prabhupada, he didn't interview us or anything, but we all just sat there and, and one by one he would call us and then he would, you know, offer, you know, offer obeisances and he would say, Say the say aloud. You know, you have to say the pranam his pranam mantra out aloud. In other words, at least you should know the pranam mantra, the spiritual master. And so that was one thing. And after the initiation, what happened was the next morning, Prabhupada called for the temple president, and he said, "You know, I initiated about eighteen of your men yesterday." You know, we were all young men, young people, you know. I was one of, maybe one of the older ones. I was 22. <laughs> so, you know, we were really quite young. I got initiated, Subhag Swami. Did Subhag Swami come here? You know him? Subhag Swami? No? Anyway, he got initiated that day also. He's, he's Bengali. He joined in London. His family had sent him he, when he was in Calcutta, he, he was associating with sadhus and they thought he may become a sadhu. So they sent him to London to study. <laughs> <laughs> so he came to London and he met Hare Krishna <laughs> and became a devotee. <laughs> and he's a wonderful devotee. He's a, he has many disciples. So he got initiated. Mahavishnu Swami, did he come here? Yes. Yes, yeah? yes, yes Mahavishnu Swami. Yes, he transitioned. Yeah, Mahavishnu. 
the, 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 the English mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So he got initiated also that day. We all got initiated together. There was about 15 of us or 18. And what happened the next morning, Prabhupada called for the temple president. And he said, you know, I give initiation to all those devotees. None of them gave me any Guru Dakshin. <laughs> <laughs> And the temple president, temple president said, Shul Prabhupada, they don't have any money. <laughs> you know, our temple was, uh, it was only just maintaining, you know, anybody gave any money, it was immediately used to pay off the debts, you know, to pay the rent and to pay different things. And so anyway, that day we all went out to Sankirtan and whatever we collected on Sankirtan, we gave that to Prabhupada. Anyway, that was one thing which happened there with Prabhupada. That uh, he, he said, he wanted to indicate there should be, should be some Guru Dakshi. I was reading Bhakti Swami's book about his initiation. And he also said when he got initiated, he didn't have any money, right? He says, Srila Prabhupada, I don't have anything. And Prabhupada told him, it's okay, you're going to give your life anyway. <laughs> so, if you give your life, then it's <laughs> So, another thing which happened with Prabhupada was, uh, I was, I was in the, Vrindavan temple, it was Krishna Balaram temple, and it was midday, and Arti came. So I picked up the cartels and we started to have kirtan. And while we were having kirtan, Prabhupada's secretary came out. You know, Prabhupada's house is at the back of the temple in Vrindavan. So Prabhupada's secretary came out from Prabhupada's house and he came to the temple room and he said, Srila Prabhupada wants to know, why is nobody playing Madanga? <laughs> you know, I was, I was just playing Kato. There was not many people there those days. The Dhaban temple was not very crowded as it is today. So I was just, lit, but Prabhupada said, every time when there's Kirtan, must be Madanga and Kato. We want to so he was very, it showed how attentive Prabhupada was, that he was in his house and I was in the temple room and Prabhupada was listening, couldn't hear Madanga. And he sent somebody to me, you know, it shows how attentive he was to everything. And he was very concerned about everything. When he would come, he would want to see the accounts, you know, are you keeping the accounts nicely? Like in England, we have, you know, we're a registered charity there and we have tax exemption. So it's important every year they audit the accounts. So he was very concerned that we would keep up our registration and have proper accounts which could be audited. And he would personally check to see these things. And he would also check, some, he would go around the building and check to see everything. In Mayapur, you come to Mayapur, you go all over Mayapur and see. And he would sometimes he would look in the toilets to see are they clean? <laughs> and if they were not clean, then you know, <laughs> he would really he would really tell. Him. And and he would and he would back it up with philosophy, just like one time there he opened the, the washroom in Mayapur, and it, it was you know it was. A, it was not in the main part of the building, it was away over in some corner of the land and there was a, a washroom there and it hadn't been properly cleaned and Prabhupada saw it was dirty and he said, why is it like this? And, and the devotee would say, Prabhupada, I didn't do it. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, you're Brahmin, you have to clean it. Yeah, and Prabhupada had studied chemistry as a young man. And he gave a chemical equation. Base plus acid gives salt plus water. 
You know that? Beta sodium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid will get sodium chloride plus H2O. Water, you know. Ba very basic chemical equation. And Prabhupada said, just like a base and an acid, when they put them together, there's a reaction. The same way, a brahmana, when there's a dirty place, they have to clean it. They cannot say, I didn't do it. They have to clean it. This was how Prabhupada was preaching to us. You know, how particular he was and how he explained everything with so much logic, you know, and with evidence to support it. And if you don't clean it, even you didn't make the mess, then you lose your brahminical qualification. So, very, very important. Another time, uh, it was with Prabhupada, we were in Juhu. It was 1977. Prabhupada's health was very poor and he was not walking anywhere. He was just laying in his room. He had taken some room in the, in the new building, which had, was not even opened, but somehow they managed to reach Prabhupada's quarters and Prabhupada came and stayed there on the top floor of the guest house there in Juhu. If you go there, Prabhupada's quarters are preserved, very nice. So Prabhupada was there and he was resting and he wanted kirtan. He wanted very short, and we were given cartels much smaller than this. They were very tiny cartels, and just two people at a time, just two of us at a time. So I was with another brahmachari, and we went in to Prabhupada's room, and we began kirtan, and we were chanting Hare Krishna. Prabhupada was laying there, listening. He just wanted kirtan. But at, at one point, the devotee who I was with, he started to chant, Govinda Jai Jai, Gopalit. A Prabhupada immediately opened his eyes and said, just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and so that was a direct instruction from Prabhupada. Just chant Hare Krishna. He just wanted to hear the Maha Mantra. He didn't want anything else. Of course, sometimes Prabhupada did chant other mantras, but for his departure, he was preparing, he could say, for leaving the world. He just wanted to hear the Hare Krishna mantra. Srila Prabhupada liked to go for walks, morning walks. Every day we'd go with him. So he liked to get eucalyptus twigs to clean the teeth. You know, Indian people, they like to use a eucalyptus, Prabhupada like very much eucalyptus twig. So one devotee, uh, they were on a morning walk, Prabhupada said, get me some twig from that tree. So the devotee was taking a twig from the tree. But the policeman came. <laughs> You cannot, what are you doing, damaging the queen's property? You know, this tree is growing in the park. And the park is the government property. You're breaking the twig from the tree. The policeman is chastising him. Is <laughs> and so Prabhupada, Prabhupada said afterwards, he said, this English government, they took all the jewels from India. The whole crown of the Queen of England, all the jewels, they all come from India. We have taken one twig and they're complaining. Why was Guru Dakshina important, Vishnu Prabhupada? Why was Guru Dakshina important? Well, it was just the principle. It was the principle, I think. You know that. You see, nobody had actually told me that we have to give Guru Daksin because we always used to speak that 
other gurus are selling their mantras and we give the mantra free. You know, we're giving the mantra free. So I, I, nobody had ever told me that when you get initiation you're meant to give dakshin. I didn't know. Of course if I know I could have arranged, but I didn't know and nobody had told me that. <laughs> Later on only found out. It's just the principle that you're accepting the shelter. Of course Prabhupada didn't need the money. He didn't want the money, but he, he wanted just that we were um, we were recognizing I get because coming from America, in America it's a little different. Devotees are a bit more wealthier there than in the UK. <laughs> yeah. the UK. And we were all living in the temple. We were not congregation. You know, we were all fully surrendered. We had given everything. You know, I, I, gave, up, I gave up my job to become a full-time devotee and whatever savings I had, I'd given everything to the temple. So, uh, that w we were just simply help maintaining the temple, to keep the temple running. Anyway, Prabhupada didn't push it, you know, he didn't, but he just thought it was unusual. In, in ISKCON in Vrindavan, um, do all the devotees also make it a practice to visit other temples like Radha Sham, Sundar, Radha Damodar, or is it just at ISKCON? Well, regarding visiting other temples in Vrindavan, you can, you can do it, but don't do it on your own. If you want to do it, it you should do it with, as a group. Like when we're having Parikrama, when we do the Parikramas, we'll go as a group. And we'll go with senior devotees who can talk about the different temples and the pastimes there and so on. But if you go as an individual, then you can, you can go astray, you can get, meet the wrong people, you know. Vrindavan, there's so many different people and different things going on. And Prabhupada was worried about the devotees going off on their own. He said, we should be focused in our own temple. We have our own morning program. We have the program there in our temple. We should be there and hear from our own devotees. But if you go to other temples, then you meet the wrong people and they may talk to you and they may start telling you things. And they say, you want to get initiation? <laughs> you know, they may take you and you know, they, they may initiate you immediately, you know. So, to avoid these kind of things. So Prabhupada, was one, he wanted to protect the devotees. Especially places like Radha Kund. Prabhupada was concerned there because there's so many Babaji's there. And when somebody had gone to Radha Kund, Prabhupada sent somebody, he said, go there and beg him to come back. But bring him back. So Prabhupada was so concerned like that that devotees coming to Vrindavan that they should be protected. They shouldn't just go here and there and hear from everyone. Mm. Well, Krishna consciousness is a process. You follow the process, you get the results. As Krishna said, as you surrender to me, I, re I reward you accordingly. Prabhupada said, you think of Krishna 10 minutes a day, Krishna will think of you 12 minutes a day. And you think of Krishna 24 hours a day, Krishna will think of you 26. Krishna can do the inconceivable. So we do want to approach Krishna and we want to approach him with that feeling of devotion. That is the real thing we have to give to Krishna. It's not the gift, it's the devotion. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.